Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is September 30, 1980, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 58. The fall of 1980 is turning out to be a season of reruns. Television shows which were stale the first time around are being shown again thanks to the actor strike in Hollywood, and the worst acts of all are those of our so-called Presidential candidates. Administrations come and go, my friends, but the more they legislate, the more the country goes to the dogs. Millions of Americans are out of work, but inflation refuses to quit. Interest rates are heading up again, so say goodbye to that new home. Our auto industry is on the ropes. Our cities are decaying. Our armed forces are falling apart, and at the center of it all our dollar is shrinking out of existence. The dollar is no longer good as gold because our gold is gone, and as long as it stays gone, all the campaign promises in the world cannot save the United States economy. The forces who stole our gold are bringing down America's economy, and now they are using our own gold to bring down war around our heads. My friends, it's time to lift our eyes from idle campaign promises to cast our vote for America before it is too late. It's time for us, the American people, to use the gold weapon ourselves. It's time for us to vote for the truth by bringing about a public investigation of the Fort Knox Gold Scandal, because only in that way can we hope to save our economy from utter ruin, and only in that way can we seize a weapon big enough to stop those who are dragging us all into the insanity of NUCLEAR WAR ONE. My three special topics this month are Topic No. 1, American Gold and the Iraq-Iran War, Topic No. 2, Russia's first strike against a Titan II missile, and Topic No. 3, Step 3 in What You Can Do, Topic No. 1. The world we live in today, my friends, seems more and more like a roller coaster. Only a short month ago we were hearing about the worldwide oil glut. There were predictions that it could easily take one or two years for the oil surplus to fade away, but rosy projections like those always seem to set the stage for trouble. This month of September got off to a bad start as the dollar fell to the lowest level in five years on money markets worldwide. Something ominous was in the wind. You and I were not told about it, but a new crisis was brewing between Iran and Iraq. On September 9, Great Britain shut down its embassy in Tehran, saying it was becoming too dangerous. Iraq and Iran were squabbling over their border, and the dispute was heating up. Iraqi troops invaded northwestern Iran seizing some 90 square miles of Iranian territory. Then on September 17, after the fact, Iraq tore up the 1975 border treaty with Iran. Next the air war erupted between the two countries. On September 22, Iraq and Iran bombed each other's airfields, and the very next day two OPEC nations, Iraq and Iran, began destroying each other's oil installations. The headline in the Washington Post for September 24, 1980 said it all, Iran bombs Baghdad, full-scale war erupts. The present fighting between Iraq and Iran was started by Iraq. For many years we've heard about the status of Iraq as a Russian client state, and with the war now underway we are always reminded of this by the controlled major media of the United States. But what is not reported to you and me, my friends, is Russia's reaction to Iraq's latest actions. The Russians have sent very blunt warnings to Iraq that they are not pleased and have shut off arms shipments to Iraq. The Russians are saying basically, we gave you arms to defend yourself against Israel, not to invade Iran. During roughly the past year and a half, little notice changes have been taking place in Iraq. Those changes have been orchestrated in parallel with those in neighboring Iran. Iraq's new strongman, Saddam Hussein, came to power in a bloody coup d'etat. 
At the time all eyes were on Iran instead, but now thousands of Iranian military personnel from the Shah's former regime are now in Iraq. They are fighting on the side of Iraq, hoping to regain power in Iran by military means. In AUDIO LETTER No. 52 last November 1979, I described how and why agents of the Rockefeller Cartel brought to ruin the late Shah of Iran. The Islamic Revolution of Ayatollah Khomeini was secretly helped along as a maneuver to oust the Shah. The Ayatollah was ushered into power by forces which he did not understand, but as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 52, those forces planned to undo it all. What I told you then was, quote, they plan to martyr the entire Khomeini government as they set off thermonuclear war." Unquote. The real Ayatollah Khomeini himself was assassinated last February 1980, as I reported that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 54, but he was replaced with a double to maintain the image of the Ayatollah as an enemy, someone for the Americans to hate. Now, by way of Iraq, Pressure is being put on Iran. The ultimate goal is to make the present government of Iran disintegrate in chaos, but you can expect many twists and turns along the way. Like Iran, Iraq is only being used as a part of a larger plan. There may well be double crosses within double crosses. Almost anything can happen, but watch for efforts to lure Russia into the Persian Gulf just as she was lured into Afghanistan. The main forces which have brought about the Iraqi attack on Iran are not those of the United States Government itself. Instead, the situation in Iraq right now is dominated by the old Rockefeller oil interests. These are headed and tightly coordinated by John J. McCloy and his associates. Since the spring of 1979 I have reported that the Rockefeller Cartel as a whole is now headless and beginning to crumble, but that is not yet true of the oil companies within the Cartel. They still intend to complete their long-range plan to recapture undisputed domination over Iran, and they are working closely with their private Israeli counterparts here and abroad to accomplish this. Their destruction of the Shah's regime was only the first half of their plan. The second half is to get rid of the interim government now in Iran, the so-called Khomeini regime. They want to destabilize the situation in Iran and take advantage of the chaos that follows. When the smoke clears, Big Oil plans again to own Iran lock, stock, and barrel, and at the same time the Bolshevik secret government here plans to take advantage of the same events to bring us closer to a nuclear war. Ever since 1914 war after war has been fought over oil. Governments have been destroyed, others created, and still others subverted, and whenever there is war for oil, gold is always the trigger. Gold is such an important weapon of war that in early 1968 the Joint Chiefs of Staff became very alarmed over the depletion of America's gold supply. They visited their then President Lyndon Johnson in the White House. In an angry confrontation they demanded that Johnson not reduce the gold stock still remaining because it was needed for purposes of war. The Rockefeller interests, now under the control of John J. McCloy and Associates, arranged earlier this year for $8 billion, that's $8,000 million in gold, to be paid to the leader of Iraq, Saddam Hussein. A very special private underground warehouse in Zurich was used in this transfer of gold. This gold was an outright bribe. It was to persuade Iraq to attack Iran. $8 billion, my friends, is a lot of money but it was a cheap price for the Rockefeller oil cartel, and for two reasons. First, the gold which was used to bribe Iraq to start the war was part of the gold which was stolen from you and me. The bulk of the gold taken from America's stockpiles was flown to Europe 
on multinational corporate jets. So, my friends, that $8 billion in gold did not cost the oil companies anything except some jet fuel, but it cost you and me part of our monetary gold, and it has been used to start a war for which you and I will pay even more. $8 billion in gold was a cheap price for the oil companies for another reason too. If their plans are successful, the Rockefeller Oil Group will get back complete control over Iran's oil and other natural resources, and they won't have to pay those untold billions in oil royalties to their new Iranian lackeys. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 52, the time came when the oil companies could no longer control their former puppet, the Shah, so out he went. They could also not control for long the real Ayatollah Khomeini, so he was killed. But if their war on Iran by way of Iraq succeeds in its ultimate purpose, the Rockefeller Oil Companies will once again constitute the Iranian State. The oil interests under John J. McCloy are playing ball with the invisible Bolshevik Government here in the United States. For the moment they both want the same thing in Iran, that is, instability and turmoil. So they are working hand in glove to create an explosion in the Persian Gulf. But the oil companies could end up finding that even they have been used by the Bolshevik secret government here in the United States because if the Bolsheviks have their way, all-out war will come before the oil cartel can consolidate their gains in Iran. Last month I revealed that the Bolsheviks here are following roughly a three-month cycle in triggering new war plans. The coming month of October 1980 is another critical month in that timetable, and sure enough, right on schedule, the Iraq-Iran War is boiling over. The United States Naval Fleet in the Indian Ocean is now being bolstered by units from our Mediterranean Fleet. At the same time, the United States is trying to get Australia, France which is very reticent, and Great Britain to join in with their navies as well. At the same time, our Bolshevik Administration is sending four AWACS airborne battle control airplanes to Saudi Arabia. Cargo planes and several hundred support personnel are also on the way. The public excuse is that this is to keep open the critical Strait of Hormuz to keep the oil tankers moving, but, my friends, it may well lead instead to an oil cutoff, and that will produce not only higher oil prices but also a national emergency here in the United States as we shift step by step onto a war footing. Topic No. 2. Three years ago today, on September 30, 1977, I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 26. In that tape I reported that the most decisive battle of the 20th century had just taken place in space. It was the Battle of the Harvest Moon, September 27, 1977. It was history's first true battle in space and in a stunning upset the United States was defeated by the Soviet Union. From that day onward Russia began evicting the United States from the military use of space. The true military balance between East and West was turned upside down. Since that time the United States has been dealing from weakness on the world stage. But our secret Bolshevik Government is unwilling to abandon its secret plans for world domination, and so, out of weakness, America has shifted to a first-strike nuclear strategy against Russia. Lately this dramatic shift in America's military posture has started coming to the surface in the news. For example, last month Presidential Directives 58 and 59 were made public. One Directive, No. 59, officially commits the United States to a first-strike nuclear posture known as counter-force targeting of our missiles. The other directive, No. 58, is to step up preparations for our leaders to hide in safe war bunkers just before they set off NUCLEAR WAR ONE. And what about you and me and our children? 
we are supposed to just wait patiently until the air raid sirens start blaring all around us. Our shift to a first strike nuclear posture actually began over two years ago, in secret. I first reported this change in AUDIO LETTER No. 36 for July 1978, and the following month in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I gave details of the secret first strike plans then being prepared. In AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I reported that America's secret plans for a first strike were producing a response in kind by the Kremlin. The Russians had learned about the plans of our own secret government for a first strike, and so they were planning to turn the tables. By allowing the United States to start the process, the Russians were planning to obtain an excuse for their own first strike against us. But I can now report that the Russian first strike strategy has changed in very important ways. My friends, it is already underway. On both sides the strategic plans for NUCLEAR WAR ONE are in a constant state of flux. And as it happens, the changes on both sides during the past two years can be illustrated with a single weapon. That weapon is America's giant Titan II missile. The Titan II is an old missile. It began to be deployed some 18 years ago in 1962. It is a liquid-fuel rocket unlike our newer Minutemen which use solid fuel. It is a maintenance headache, and we do not have a large number of them, my friends. Only 54 were deployed originally. But the Titan II has one advantage which has become very important to our Bolshevik secret government. That advantage is sheer size. It has a payload capability called throw weight by the military which is many times larger than that of a Minuteman. That gives the Titan II a special value for modification to new missions which were not originally planned. Some two years ago one of these major modification programs was carried out on Titan II missiles. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 37, they have been modified for fractional orbital bombardment. Normally American missiles are aimed over the North Pole at Russia, but that is no longer the case with the Titan IIs. When war begins, the Titans will be launched in many different directions, and they will not follow the normal ballistic trajectory of a standard ICBM. Instead, they will accelerate all the way to orbital speed. They will then race around the globe toward Russia. They will approach Russia from all directions, not just from the north, and they will arrive at twice the speed of other missiles. As they approach their targets, the warheads will retrofire out of orbit. From there they will rain destruction on their Russian targets. At least that is the plan. American military planners believe that they can succeed in getting at least a few of the Titan IIs launched in spite of Russia's Cosmospheres on patrol overhead. They also believe that the short flight time of the Titans will keep them safe from Russia's man-killer satellites, the Cosmos Interceptors. Finally, the secret planners here believe that the Russians will find terminal defense impossible. The Titan warheads will simply arrive from too many directions for effective anti-missile defense. But last February 1980 I reported that Russia does plan to have an effective last-ditch defense to shoot down any incoming ICBMs. The Russians began work on it in June 1978, two months before I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 37. It is a flying anti-ballistic missile system. It is made up of charged particle beam weapons carried by Russia's supersonic transport, the Tu-144. The Tu-144s were suddenly removed from service without explanation in June 1978, and now I can report to you that the Tu-144 flying anti-missile system is fully operational in Russia. Meanwhile America's fleet of Titan IIs is beginning to dwindle. On August 24, 1978, an accident supposedly crippled a freshly modified Titan II at Rock, Kansas. 
It made headlines with a massive leak which sent poisonous reddish-brown fumes towering into the sky. The huge missile was ruined. Scratch 1. 53 left. Now, my friends, the Titan IIs are being modified again. This time only the warhead is involved. They are still programmed for fractional orbital bombardment, which requires use of a smaller warhead than normal. But now compact new generation warheads are being installed on the Titan IIs. Each packs a 24 megaton wallop. That's over 1,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima A-bomb. But the most deadly feature of the new Titan II warheads is their Cobalt Jacket. The Titan II warhead is a doomsday weapon designed to create vast amounts of deadly radiation over wide areas for a generation. The Bolsheviks here are well aware of Russia's vast civil defense setup. They know that unlike the United States, Russia's rulers have tried to ensure that as many Russians as possible will survive a nuclear attack, but the Bolsheviks here plan to make those preparations useless. Even if the Russians stay underground for a year or two years or five years, eventually they will have to come out of their shelters, and if they do so after an American Cobalt Bomb attack, they will still die. And so, one way or another, the Russians intend to make doubly sure that no Titan II succeeds in bombarding Russia. For nearly three years I have reported that Russia's levitating weapons platforms, the Cosmospheres, can blast our missiles in their silos, and this month on September 19 that is exactly what was done. The target was a Titan II in its silo near Damascus, Arkansas. The Russians were sending a message to our Bolshevik secret government. Their war of attrition against America's war-making capability is now being stepped up. The Russians are now embarking on their own new version of a first strike, one target at a time. Russian intelligence learned several months ago about the plan to retrofit the Titan IIs with Cobalt Doomsday Warheads. The decision was made to destroy one of these retrofitted missiles in its silo at the first favorable opportunity. The Titans are notorious for their leaks during maintenance. It was decided that the first major leak of a retrofitted Titan II would be used as a cover for the Russian strike. On Thursday, September 18, the Russians got the chance that they were waiting for. Around 6.45 that evening a retrofitted Titan II with a Cobalt Doomsday warhead was being worked on in its silo near Damascus, Arkansas. Suddenly, we are told, an accident took place which has no parallel since the Titan IIs became operational 18 years ago. Supposedly a wrench was dropped, knocking a hole in the side of the missile. In any case, the Russians had the leak they wanted to provide a cover for what they were about to do. For more than eight hours Air Force personnel worked steadily, but without great urgency, to try to fix the leak. Meanwhile the silo door remained closed to avoid attracting attention. The main worry at the time was not an explosion, but toxicity of the fumes. As Air Force Secretary Hans Mark testified to Congress on September 24, Quote, the technical experts did not expect any explosion at all." Unquote. As one crew after another entered and left the Titan II silo in protective suits, a Russian Cosmosphere was floating high above in the stratosphere. They waited until after most of the nearby residents had been warned and evacuated. Then at 3.01 a.m. the Cosmosphere crew received the order to open fire. Their charged Particle Beam weapon had for hours been aimed and ready, locked onto the center of the huge silo door. The door, made of concrete and steel and weighing 740 tons, was designed to withstand a near miss of a 10 megaton H-bomb, but it was no match for the charged Particle Beam. In a fraction of a second the beam blew a hole through the silo door. As the door buckled and twisted, the beam created a tremendous shock wave inside the silo. 
The fragile outer shell of the missile instantly was crushed like an eggshell. The fuel and oxidizer tanks ruptured in a thousand places, and the propellants ran together. As long as they are kept apart, the fuel and oxidizer of the Titan II offer very little danger of explosion, but they are of a type called hypergolic propellants. That is, the moment they contact each other, they ignite, and that is what happened in the missile silo. Huge amounts mixed instantly as the missile crumpled inward. The result was a tremendous explosion. It threw the already ruined silo door all over the countryside, and the mighty Titan II launched this doomsday warhead not into Russia but into the Arkansas pasture a few hundred feet away. And so, my friends, there were really two explosions at the Titan II missile silo. First was the explosion of part of the atoms of the silo door itself when it was hit by the Particle Beam, and that in turn triggered the second explosion, that of the missile itself, in the silo. Several eyewitnesses described this double blast in various ways, but the clearest description was given by two injured Air Force personnel, Sergeants Michael Hansen and Archie James. Their statements in a September 21 news conference were reported the next day in the New York Times. The Times said, quote, The two men said that they were about 100 feet from the missile silo when the first of two explosions occurred. They agreed that there had been one smaller explosion first which knocked them to the ground before a much larger explosion with monstrous force." Unquote. After the explosion, the Air Force mystified everyone with its nervousness about the warhead. After all, everyone knows an ICBM carries a nuclear warhead, so why not admit it? Now, my friends, you know why. They were desperately afraid that there might be a slip of the tongue by someone about the new Doomsday Cobalt warhead of the Titan II and so strict orders were given to say nothing at all about it. For our Titan II missile fleet the score is now scratch 2, 52 to go. The Russians are hoping to bring about a shutdown of the Titan missile force by means of public outcry if possible, but if not, they intend to make sure in other ways that not one is ever launched at Russia. The Titan II with its new 24-megaton Cobalt warhead is a first-strike weapon of our secret government. But the Russians too are making use of Cobalt bombs in their first-strike strategy against the United States. The Russian Cobalt bombs are a totally different design, not for use in the atmosphere but underground and underwater to generate earthquakes. Two months ago on July 28, an earthquake took place in the Midwest that shook 12 states. Geologists in that area were mystified, saying that it seemed like an impossible earthquake. There are no known faults in the area where it was centered, not far from Fort Knox, Kentucky. But in AUDIO LETTER No. 56 I reported how Russia brought about that seemingly impossible earthquake using two underground Cobalt bombs. Last month this Bolshevik Administration announced that Russia's leadership is now a number one target in its first strike posture, and Russia is responding in kind, my friends. The real headquarters of America's secret government is not here in Washington, D.C., but in New York City, and now feverish preparations are underway to create an impossible earthquake in New York City as part of Russia's new first strike campaign against the United States. Topic No. 3 When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 57 last month, I mentioned that I had not yet received any reports or replies by Senator Proxmire to your letters, but since that time many of you have let me know that he has answered you and many of you have sent me copies of the letters that he sent you. My friends, in my two previous tapes I cautioned you to beware of any attempts to just brush you off. If you have never written to anyone in Congress before, 
you may have felt that you got a very responsive reply from Senator Proxmire. If so, I suggest that you stop the tape at this point and restart it with your letter from Senator Proxmire in hand. Please follow along word for word. I'm about to read to you what you are likely to have received. If your letter differs from what I am about to read, by all means please send me a copy. First, the date at the top is likely to be August 27, September 4, or September 9. Other dates are also possible, but large batches were sent out on those dates. Dear So-and-so, Thanks so much for your recent letter concerning the allegations initiated by Dr. Peter Beter concerning massive gold thefts from the United States Treasury at Fort Knox, especially an unrecorded shipment which occurred in 1965. While this precious metal is no longer needed to back up our currency, I can certainly appreciate your concern in this issue. Similar concerns were expressed in 1974, at which time former Treasury Secretary Simon invited all members of Congress to participate in a personal inspection of the reserves held at Fort Knox. Several members joined in the tour at that time. In addition, at the request of the Congress, the General Accounting Office and the Treasury also completed an audit of the gold reserves. The General Accounting Office is an investigative arm of the Congress, as you may know, and participates in the yearly audits of the Treasury's gold reserves. As to the situation which took place in 1965 concerning the missing shipment of gold, I am asking the Treasury's Inspector General to give me a complete report. Once I have this information, I will be in a better position to determine whether any future action is warranted. I appreciate your interest in this important matter. Sincerely, William Proxmire, Chairman." Unquote. The signature which looks for all the world like a personal signature is Bill Proxmire. Quote, unquote. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? The tone is friendly, and it looks like a personal letter. And that is what you are supposed to believe it is. But of course, if your letter coincided with the one I just read, you know now that it was not a personal letter. It's just one of many identical letters turned out like popcorn by a computer-controlled typewriter. Even the signature, which looks so real, is made by a special signature duplicating machine. If you have a neighbor who also received a letter, put one on top of the other and hold them up to the light, and you will find that the computerized typing is identical, and you will also discover that the signatures are identical, unlike real signatures. They may be in slightly different positions on the two letters, but by moving them around you will be able to make the two signatures coincide. My friends, the computerized letter is used by Senators and Congressmen today for several reasons. For one thing, of course, it saves work. For another, it makes constituents feel good, thinking they have received a personal reply, but most of all it helps Senators and Congressmen avoid involving themselves in many issues. When you receive a personal letter from a busy Senator or Congressman, you may wonder, am I the only one who wrote about this? Most people, if they think that, will just give up, and so the computerized letter is designed to encourage you to feel isolated. Notice that the letter I just read you from Senator Proxmire sounds as if he is answering you alone. He avoids mentioning that many others have written to him about the same thing. But you should know that in Congress every letter is considered to represent at least 500 people. Now I invite you to look more closely at the actual content of Senator Proxmire's computerized letter to you. It's filled with red flags. First, in paragraph 1 is his statement that gold is no longer needed to back up the dollar. That is red flag number one. It goes against common sense, history, and daily news about gold prices and the dollar. Senator Proxmire is parroting the old Rockefeller line which was used years ago to calm us, to deceive us, while they phased gold out of Fort Knox and into their own pockets. The second paragraph is worded to convey the impression 
that all this has been looked into and found to be untrue, but read it carefully, my friends. You will discover more red flags. For example, he mentions the so-called tour of the Fort Knox Bullion Depository in 1974, but a tour is not an inventory, and not one of the visitors to Fort Knox in September 1974 was a specialist in gold. What is more, the visitors were not even told about, much less shown, the actual gold vault itself. This is a huge maximum security vault which occupies the central portion of the depository building and extends well below ground. Instead, the visitors were allowed to enter only one small jail cell-like compartment to look at some reddish-tinted alleged gold bars. In AUDIO LETTER No. 2 for July 1975 I gave details about all this. The Fort Knox tour of 1974 cited by Senator Proxmire was just a peep show amounting to a total fraud. Then he refers to the so-called audit of our gold reserves by the General Accounting Office and the Treasury. Another red flag, my friends, because an audit is not a physical inventory or count of the gold itself. An audit is only an examination of the books, and from the very beginning my charge has been that those books are fraudulent and therefore useless. And to make matters worse, the Audit Committee consisted of 13 Treasury personnel with only two GAO personnel tagging along to make it look good. I described that entire episode in detail in my audio book talking tape entitled The Fort Knox Gold Scandal and What It Means to You of March 1975. Paragraph 3 of the Proxmire Computer Letter is a tradition in Congress today. It's called Pass the Buck, but he does not even pass it to an objective agency. For example, he could have referred it to the General Accounting Office. At least the GAO is an arm of Congress itself, as Proxmire himself mentions. But no, you wrote to Proxmire about the Treasury's failure to account for a gold shipment worth over a billion dollars today, and whom does he ask to look into it? Why, the Treasury itself. Actually, the only thing resembling concrete action mentioned in the letter is Proxmire's request for a report from the Treasury's Inspector General. So it seems appropriate to take a few minutes to tell you about Proxmire's previous experience with the Treasury Inspector General. The occasion was the scandal that erupted in December 1978 over missing gold at the New York Assay Office. As you may recall, there were news reports at the time that some 5,200 ounces of gold could not be accounted for. The story was brought to light only because of the determined efforts of a dedicated group of employees at the New York Assay Office. These employees, known as the whistleblowers, tried for years to seek redress for corrupt practices there among the top management. They contacted various officials within the Treasury the Justice Department, Congress, including Senator Proxmire, and the press. For their efforts, some of them received severe retribution through their jobs, demotions, and so on, but against all odds they succeeded in bringing to light the matter of the missing gold. Then as now, Proxmire turned to the Treasury itself for a report on the possible misbehavior of a Treasury operation, the New York Assay Office. And on December 19, 1978, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury Robert Carswell wrote to Senator Proxmire and said, quote, I must now inform you that there have been significant irregularities in accounting and management procedures in the New York Assay Office that appear to go back a number of years." Unquote. Carswell added, quote, The full truth may never be known because of the inadequate records kept over the years." Unquote. In other words, my friends, the records at the New York Assay Office were unreliable, just like the records at Fort Knox. In his letter to Proxmire, Carswell also mentioned that the Treasury's new Inspector General had been assigned to the Assay Office case. The Office of Inspector General was a new office, created only three months earlier 
and according to the Carswell letter to Proxmire, the first investigation handed to the Treasury Inspector General was that of the New York Assay Office. And so the Treasury's Inspector General began his career in that post with a case of missing gold. Now, according to his computer letter to you, Proxmire has asked him to look into another case of missing gold, the 1965 missing shipment from Fort Knox. The Treasury Inspector General took charge of a group of agents detailed from the Secret Service, which is another branch of the Treasury. Then he directed a so-called investigation of the missing gold at the New York Assay Office, which by his own words, quote, consisted of interviews, unquote, plus a review of security and procedures, no sworn testimony, just interviews, and oddly enough, no one confessed to any criminal activity or theft. So on May 11, 1979, the Treasury Inspector General closed the files on his investigation of the New York Assay Office. He wrote a memorandum that day to Deputy Treasury Secretary Carswell summarizing the results of this great investigation. With one exception, a man who had already been sent to jail, he said, quote, No evidence has been developed that any personnel were involved in the theft of gold and silver from the New York Assay Office." Unquote. That one exception is not discussed, but you might find it revealing. It was an employee who was caught trying to carry a bar of gold out the door inside a rolled-up newspaper. The reason he was caught, my friends, was that the gold bar slipped out of the newspaper and fell on the floor. The so-called investigation of the Treasury Inspector General also succeeded in deciding that less gold was missing than originally reported. What we heard in news reports was 5,200 ounces, but by the time the Treasury Inspector General got through, he had whittled that down to a mere 4,100 ounces. He also forwarded the sanitized Treasury report on itself to the Justice Department for their determination. Not surprisingly, the Justice Department wrote back that quoting the Inspector General's memorandum again, there is no evidence in the present record that any employee of the New York SA office personally benefited from the practices described in the report." Unquote. And the Justice Department is said to have declined prosecution due to, quote, the absence of any motive of personal gain relating to the settlement procedures. Unquote. There was never another peep out of Senator William Proxmire about the strange goings-on at the New York Assay Office. Apparently he was well satisfied by the self-serving Treasury investigation of itself, so much so that now he is passing the buck to exactly the same Office of the Treasury in the matter of the 1965 missing shipment of gold from Fort Knox. My friends, I never told you that what we are trying to do would be easy. I do believe that it can be done if we will stick with it, no matter what. But now you have a small taste of what we are up against. In the case of the missing gold at the New York Assay Office, Senator Proxmire acted as if he just did not want to know, so he relied on the Treasury to investigate itself through its Office of Inspector General. Now in the case of the missing gold shipment from Fort Knox, his initial response reflected in his computer letters to you was the same. My friends, from what I've said so far, you may be thinking that I'm about to say, forget Senator Proxmire, we have to try something else. But that is not what I'm saying at all. There is more to the story, and a glimmer of hope that Senator Proxmire can be persuaded to take meaningful action. But I do believe that you must have a realistic understanding of the situation if we are to succeed. To that end, I think a few words are in order about Senator Proxmire's public background. E. William Proxmire got his start in politics long ago after he married into the Rockefeller family. He ran as a Democrat for Governor of Wisconsin in 1952, 54, and 56 and lost each time, but his big chance came in a special Senatorial election on August 27, 1957. It was Proxmire, my friends, 
who filled the Senate vacancy of the late Senator Joseph McCarthy. Proxmire was re-elected in 1958 and has been in the Senate ever since. Throughout his Senate career Proxmire has been deeply involved in the most powerful committees of Congress dealing with banking, currency, housing, in other words, our economy. Whatever has happened during those years, Proxmire was there. In 1961 the so-called London Gold Pool Agreement was set up. It was an informal agreement that was never authorized by Congress. I repeat, never authorized by Congress. And under that agreement our gold started flowing out of the United States in a hemorrhage that lasted nearly seven years. One courageous Congressman, Frank Shelf of Kentucky, spoke repeatedly on the floor of Congress about what was happening to our gold. In AUDIO LETTER no. 2 for July 1975 I read to you his sworn statement about the secret shipments of gold out of Fort Knox during those years. But throughout the halls of Congress the warning words of Congressman Frank Shelf were totally ignored, and Senator William Proxmire was among those who were there but paid no attention. And so we should not be surprised if we encounter resistance by Senator Proxmire to leading a public investigation of our gold reserves. Long ago he became entangled with the special interests of the Rockefeller Group, who in turn spirited away our gold, and Proxmire was there in Congress when our gold was taken. So he could be accused of malfeasance for neglecting to take any action up to now to protect our gold. Under the circumstances, Proxmire may well look upon a public investigation of our missing gold as a can of worms for him. But my friends, we do not want Proxmire's hide. We want his help. He is in the best possible position to do it if he will, and there is an inkling that perhaps he can be persuaded to take action. On September 5, my friend Mr. Edward Durrell wrote to Senator Proxmire urging him to take up the investigation of our nation's gold supplies. Mr. Durrell has done this many times before and has been met with a stone wall. But this time, this time Mr. Durrell wrote in the wake of your barrage of letters, and on September 11 Proxmire sent this reply and I now quote, Dear Mr. Durrell, I have your letter regarding an unreported shipment of gold which occurred at Fort Knox in 1965 and the possibility that there may have been similar unreported incidents. While, as you know, the United States is no longer on the gold standard, I can appreciate your concern in this issue. I have already asked the Treasury Department's Inspector General to look into the matter and give me a complete report. In view of your correspondence, however, I am also asking the Justice Department and the General Accounting Office to also investigate the situation you outline. The General Accounting Office is an investigative arm of the United States Congress. Once I have this information, I will be in a better position to determine whether any future action is warranted. Sincerely, William Proxmire, Chairman." Unquote. My friends, this is still a long way short of agreeing to what we have requested, that is, a public investigation by Proxmire's Committee, but it is a step in the right direction. So it's up to us to redouble our efforts. We have to make it clear that there are many of us, that we are not going to go away, that we will not be satisfied with anything less than a public investigation by his Committee and that he will have our complete support. To do that, I urge that you again contact Senator Proxmire and get everyone else to do so that you possibly can. And if you are willing to spend a few dollars, I urge you to use a mailgram this time for a greater impact. All you have to do is to call Western Union and they will charge it to your telephone bill. A long message is not necessary. But I suggest that you tell Senator Proxmire you want action, not just comforting form letters. 
Tell him that you want a public Congressional investigation of our gold supplies by his committee, which has jurisdiction, not more cover-ups by the Executive Branch, and repeat your pledge of firm support if he will open the investigation which you request. I also have a second suggestion this month which I think will mean more to you after I tell you the following. The secret gold shipment from Fort Knox on January 20, 1965 took place the very day Lyndon Johnson was inaugurated President as I reported last month, and I can now reveal, my friends, that this shipment did not end up at the New York Assay Office. It wound up instead in a ranch in Mexico owned jointly by President and Mrs. Johnson, and President Johnson arranged for the Treasury Department to give Mrs. Johnson a special license to deal in gold bullion as a private citizen. Yet at that time you and I could not even own gold except in jewelry. The Fort Knox gold scandal of today was predictable long ago for those with eyes to see. The famous prophet of the 1929 stock market crash, Roger Ward Babson, gave a clear warning of things to come while the Fort Knox Bullion Depository was still being built. There was an article about his warnings in the Literary Digest for August 29, 1936. The article described Babson's objections in the words, quote, by dumping most of America's gold hoard into a steel and concrete strong box in the mountain fortress at Fort Knox, Kentucky, Uncle Sam is putting too many of his eggs in one basket." Unquote. Two very relevant questions posed by Babson were also mentioned. 1. Is not the United States as liable to have internal revolution as to be attacked by foreign nations? And 2. Are not gold and commodities much safer distributed among millions of people than stored in Russian fashion under the control of politicians? The article quoted Babson as he thundered, quote, To secure control of nearly one-half the world's total gold supply requires only securing control of the White House. The key to these great vaults is hanging on the wall of the President's private office." Unquote. With those prophetic words of 44 years ago in mind, I now offer you my second suggestion for this month. We need to use every avenue available to begin to make others aware that there is a question about our gold reserves, and so I suggest that you write a brief letter to the editor to every newspaper, large and small, in your area. Don't try to say a lot. Just open up the thought that we ought to think about our gold reserves as we prepare to elect a President. Here is a sample of what I mean to get you started. Letter to the Editor All the Presidential candidates this year are talking about our troubled economy in the old conventional terms, but conventional economic cures don't seem to be working. Could it be that the illness is not conventional? Congressional Legislation H.R. 7874 is now pending to look into persistent rumors that our monetary gold to back up the dollar is depleted or gone. If so, no wonder the dollar is shrinking and gold prices mushrooming. When we go to the polls, maybe we ought to keep in mind that whoever we vote for will have the keys to all our gold, that is, if there is any left. You may succeed in getting only one letter published, or none at all, but all of us working together have to think of ourselves as scattering seed. A lot of our letters to editors, just like seed, will fall on barren land. But if even one letter does get published, it can begin to alert thousands of newspaper readers. So please do it now, my friends. There is no time to be wasted. Now it's time to give you my last-minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I've tried to show you a little more clearly the connection between gold and war. Our own gold, which has been stolen from us, is being used to drag you and me into war, so we must seize the gold weapon ourselves and turn it around. By breaking open the gold scandal, we must wage preventive war, a war of truth, in order to prevent a war of missiles, bombs, particle beam weapons and clashing armies. 
What happened to the Titan II missile which exploded in its silo earlier this month serves to illustrate the stakes in our preventive war. The secret Bolshevik Government of the United States has transformed the Titan II into a first strike doomsday weapon against Russia. But the Titan II at Damascus, Arkansas was itself the victim of a Russian first strike. For the first time the Russians have now demonstrated the ability of their Cosmospheres to destroy our ICBMs in their silos. Day by day we come closer and closer to the outbreak of all-out thermonuclear war. The secret rulers of the United States and the rulers of Russia are both embarked on their own separate and very different first-strike strategies. The Bolsheviks here want to achieve a first strike against Russia that will set off all-out war. The Russians, on the other hand, want to achieve the opposite. They want to make all-out war impossible by destroying America's ability to fight. And so, my friends, the Bolsheviks here keep struggling to prepare for a single massive blow at Russia, even though America will be destroyed. And to prevent the massive American first strike, the Russians are conducting a campaign of localized first strikes. One day a Mount St. Helens explodes. Another day a Titan missile explodes, and on another day soon a major city may seem to explode in a seemingly impossible earthquake. No matter who wins the first strike tug of war, the Russians or the Bolsheviks here, America loses. And my friends, you and I are America, so it is up to you and me to defend our great land and ourselves. No one else is going to do it for us, but our forefathers left us a Constitution which grants us the freedom, the power, and the responsibility to do the job, and if our Lord Jesus Christ wills it, we will succeed. Two months ago I began giving you my answers to the question many of you had started asking me, what can I do? Many of the things we need to do require little money but time, dedication, and perseverance. Even so, we must not deceive ourselves. Freedom does not always come for free. The challenge we face today is no less than what our forefathers faced 200 years ago. So if we want to prevail in this struggle, we can do no less than they did. As they expressed it in concluding the Declaration of Independence, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.